Hey, Dustin Sandlin, this is a special episode. Do you know why? It's a book review episode, and it's your book. It would have been really weird if you'd said, like, no, I don't know why. Because we need to talk about my book, and I was hoping you'd prepared. Have you prepared? I have, yeah. I've got all my notes sitting here. I want to talk about the book itself first, though. But I, I don't think people have to listen to this book in order for them to enjoy this episode. Would you agree? Yeah, okay. The book is How to Think, A Survival Guide for a World at Odds by Alan Jacobs. And obviously, since I picked the book, I liked the book. But why do you think people don't need to listen to it? This is a deep, thinky book, obviously. But um, the principles we're going to talk about, they're pretty, uh, I don't know, it's not like a plot line. You, you don't have to listen to an entire book to get the story arc and stuff like that. And, and I'm going I'm to tell you more about my thoughts on this book in particular in a second. But, but first, I, I think we need to address something. This is, this is written by a human, Alan Jacobs, and in the book... He yeah. mentions other podcasts that he's listens to, right? So, I mean... Yeah, he lives in our world a little bit, I think. I, I think it's possible he may stumble upon this episode and listen to this episode. So we need to address that. How do we address that? I would like to introduce you to Alan Jacobs because I don't think... I don't know. He probably has no idea who we are. So can I do that real quick? Okay, I, I accept. All right, Mr. Jacobs, here's the deal. We, we normally pull a third chair up to the table every once in a while and we talk to people. So we're talking specifically to you. I think this is the only time we ever talked to one human. But um, Alan, this is my buddy Matt. Matt is a hyper-intelligent individual. He, he Hi, lives Alan. in Lander, Wyoming. He's a pastor. He's got multiple degrees. Matt, I think it's history. There's some military tactics in there. There's some theology. And then there's, what's the other one? There's another, oh, Western Thought. This is right up his alley, but on top of all that, Matt is probably one of the most hyper-competent, socially intelligent people I know, which is why I asked him to be my friend a while back. <laughs> so anyway, he cares about the Bible and the internet. He has a thing called 10-Minute Bible Hour, where he talks through the, the hard stuff in the Bible. It's an interesting dude, and um, he recommended this book to the entire internet. So I think you should, uh, I don't know, maybe give him a tweet. At Matt Whitman TMBH. Is that too strong? I went too strong. That was pretty Matt. strong. That, I'm sorry. That was I assertive. Now. Yeah. I was almost uncomfortable. Yeah. So, Mr. Jacobs, <laughs> this is my friend Destin Sandlin. He lives in northern Alabama, and he is an engineer by trade, rocket scientist. He doesn't claim that because it makes him sound fancy, and his mom told him not to get all fancy sounding just because mom he was a no. rocket scientist. Literally, she told him that on the day he got his degree. But he worked at the Redstone Test Center forever and made rockets and did tests. And it's been really fascinating to follow his journey in that regard. But at the same time that he's been doing that, he's also been doing this internet thing, especially with his YouTube channel, Smarter Every Day, where he does educational stuff, largely about science, but nothing's off limits. And part of the reason that I think he and I are friends is because I think even though he is a a hard sciences engineering guy, I think he's wired more like you in that he thinks really hard about thinking. He thinks about the social dance of thinking. He thinks about the big meta picture of thinking and he likes to understand it. And, and so your book is like a more complex version of the conversations that we have as we think about the same kind of stuff. And so I really wanted him to read this thing because I thought it would supercharge our discussions and move the whole thing forward. And then it ended up just becoming a part of the, the podcast. So thanks for writing it. And um, if you are listening, I hope we don't completely disappoint you. But we'll try and give real honest feedback about what we thought. What do you think? Is that enough third chair? I think so. Am I, am I, uh, am I clear to push Mr. Jacobs away from the table? Like literally, I have a chair here. I can push yeah, it like, away. Be gentle. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, I mean. Listen to this chair. Gentle. It's leaving. <laughs> Bye. I, Bye, Alan. I, you seemed great. Okay, so now we're going to be honest. Why the heck did you pick another book that's like hardcore thinky and there's like no stories and stuff? I had people text me push the and tell me, really? like, Matt's really? not allowed to pick stories anymore or pick books anymore because this mm -hmm. is so hard to listen mm -hmm. to. What's the deal, man? How many people texted you? 40? 60? A couple hundred? Just one. So it was one. So person... <laughs> Would have been another word you could use to describe how many people it was that texted you. That's true, but... So one person. One person texted me, but they have a point. So here, here's the deal. When I pick books, I usually pick books that are fun because people only have a certain amount of time to listen to stuff, and they want to pick stuff that's interesting mm -hmm. and entertaining and things like that. And so I pick books like Ender's Game and just, you know, really... F Which was fun. Yeah, it's fun, but... 
you pick books like make me explore the inner depths of my soul and like ha- try to you try to make me have an existential crisis while I'm riding the bush hog, dude. What's the deal? Good literature does that to you, whether it's fiction or otherwise, right? But okay, first of all, I'm not going to defend myself on this at the expense of the books you've picked. Ender's Game was wonderful. I didn't think it necessarily would be, but it really worked for me and it made me think about stuff and it affected my life. Ready Player One was silly, a little more lightweight. It did not change my life, but I really had fun with it. And there were a few themes that were enjoyable to explore. So I like the books that you have picked, but taking Ender's Game as an example, it was subversive. And you feel like you're getting a book here about kid stuff that's kind of cute and harmless, and then it kind of amps up in terms of intensity. And by the end, you're thinking about like life and death and you know, really effectively, you get to the end, you're thinking about the repugnant cultural other. You're thinking about that dangerous, distant other that you don't know what to do with. Well, oh, holy that's cow, exactly that was where this book takes you. Whitman, that was masterful. That was, that was, was re- that was, was really it? good. I, I mean, yeah, dude, that was good. You want to round out the thought for me? You tracking? I didn't see that coming, but so you're saying. Ba-ba. Oh, wait, I'm about to do the thing where I say, so you're saying, which is what this book told me not to do. But I gave you permission, so it's cool. Okay, so what you're saying is that Ender's Game does similar things to what this book does, only subversively, because it makes you think about people that are different from you and eventually get to the point where you can try to empathize with them. Roger that, that, my good friend. Dang, that was good. Yeah, okay. And so one does it artfully through great storytelling, and you experiencing those things to wrestle with vicariously through a character with whom you share some traits and some not traits. The other kind of kicks down the front door, bursts through the brick wall like the Kool-Aid man, is like, hey, let's think about who we are inside and how we talk with other people. But they (laughs) both push us, and I want to get pushed, figuratively. Okay, so that being said... Sometimes books like this, the, the way they're packaged, they're, they're less palatable. They're, they're just harder to consume. But I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it because, holy cow, dude. I, at the end of this book, I feel, you know, he, he, one of the things he talks about at the end of the book is, you know, be careful with your metaphors. But l- l- I just want to try one. Okay. Every interaction that I have on social media with people that I don't agree with, it feels like this dance. It feels like we're two fencers and we're like, going at it and we're trying to score points against each other or something like that. Or, or maybe, well, I mean, to use the illustration that he used, because he says we shouldn't think this way, and I did, like a battlefield, right? And so I'm up against yeah. this other person, and I'm trying to strategically win the argument or win the battle. Reading this book feels like you're on that battlefield, but you have this third perspective. It's It's like if if one side during the Civil War had instantly had satellite imagery that they could use so they could see from above how the battle was playing out and they could just watch the points that each other were making and say, oh, look, oh, he's, he's doing this there. Oh, he's building the straw man so that he can, you know, or does that make any sense? Yeah, it really does. And it's not, I- that, it's not that you use that, that perspective to... Uh, more decisively kill your enemy, it's that you want to understand the battle in general. And I think this book has helped me do that in a way that I wasn't really prepared for. And uh, since reading it, there's a couple things that, particularly from the checklist at the end, that I think about before I tweet something or before I respond on the internet. So thank you for suggesting the book. Um, it is cool. It is vegetables, that, or maybe not vegetables. This is like meat and potatoes, right? I mean, this is hardcore stuff. So yeah, this is definitely not cotton candy like some of them that I suggest. And I'm glad for that. I, I want to be changed by the things that I invest in reading. And thank you for suggesting Ender's Game as our last one because I got to the end and I realized that, wow, I, you know, the other is not necessarily my enemy and. There's a quest to be embarked on like Ender to go and understand the enemy that I just got done eradicating. And so when I came to this book, if I'm to be totally truthful, my pride brain was relabeling this book, how to win, how to win or how to be reaffirmed that you already think right. 
And I think that's honestly what I was hoping the book would do when I downloaded it and turned it on and started to listen to it in the car. I wanted it, I was hoping that I would go through and everything would be like, oh, I already do that. <laughs> I already do that too. I'm already a great thinker. And it didn't do that. It pushed well, back me on you, me and well, made where, me feel weird. Why did you download this book? Like you didn't just find it. Somebody told you about it, obviously. Who told you about it and why did you why did you read it? To yeah, my with? friend Mark, who is a journalism professor, I think I've mentioned him to you before. He's the one who recommended it to me. This guy, Alan Jacobs, I believe was at the same undergraduate college where Mark went. I think they were both at Wheaton in Wheaton, Illinois at the same time. And so I think that's what caused Mark to read the book. And Mark, well, about four years ago, no, four years ago, it's been whew, more like 10, 12 years ago now, I gathered the people who I respected the most at that time in terms of sort of academic-y thinkers, a guy named Matt Osterkamp, my friend Aaron Utecht, and my friend Mark Coddington. And I was like, hey, we're all guys who right now are using too much of our intellectual energy to complain about things we don't like, about the world, about religion. What if we put our heads together on a couple of long writing retreats and tried to make a book of constructive proposals for how to make it better? And so like, these guys were on that kind of Mount Rushmore of, of peers who I hyper-respect. And Mark has always been a dude who's a very, very honest thinker. He doesn't need to win at stuff. He's very secure in his own skin. And so when he recommended the book, I was like, this will make me better. I need to read it. And then I read it and I was like, this will also make Destin better. I want him to read it too. And then I want to use it to sharpen each other. So that's how it happened. Cool. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing it with me. I appreciate it. And uh, right now, after talking about all that, there's two things I'm thinking about. Okay. If I had a Mount Rushmore of friends who would be on it, and what would satellite imagery do to the Civil War? <laughs> so, <laughs> Those sound like really good episodes. They really do. Okay, cool. So we jump right into it? Yeah. And and you know what? There's about the like, ton of people I left off my list of super smart people who I don't want to feel bad that they weren't on that Mount Rushmore list. So, hey, everybody else, you're real smart too. Sorry. No, you no, you chiseled it in stone, man. Mm -mm. It's a bigger Mount Rushmore. It's a future one that includes all the presidents, so no one has to feel bad. <laughs> it's a very big mountain. Huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this episode. Yes. You can get a free audiobook by going to audible.com slash NDQ. Obviously, this is a book review episode. We love this. We love like everybody listening to the book on their own, and then we come together and we talk about it. This was Matt's. I'm going to pick the next one. It's a blast. But the important thing here is they sponsor the episode. So you can get your own audiobook, whatever the heck you want, by going to audible.com slash NDQ. Matt, what's the other way they can get a book? You can text NDQ to 500-500, and you can get the whole same deal set up on your phone that way. Yeah, and you actually own the books. You can send them to people. So we're actually in the middle of a book review, so I don't think we have to belabor this. You obviously know what's going on here. Get it audible.com slash NDQ or text NDQ to 500-500. Thanks to Audible for supporting. Thanks, Audible. Okay, buddy. One of the things that a couple of professors told me in grad school was, hey, I know you got a lot of books to read here. Grad school is a little bit different animal. I do need you to, to understand all of these books. But here's a pro tip. If you really want to understand a book about ideas, read the introduction again and again until you could repeat the author's argument without even having read the rest of the book and you will get the book and you'll power through it fast. The introduction is the book in a good book. So I spent a lot of time on this introduction. I think I've been through it ugh, half a dozen times easily and I've got a bunch of stuff that stood out to me, but I'm guessing some stuff stood out to you too here. So I'm going to bounce it to you first. What jumped off the page for you in the introduction? Um, I didn't, I didn't take notes like that. I took bigger overarching notes. Like, for example, my first question for you is, is this book in, like, totality, is it a full-on response to Twitter and what's happening on Twitter? That's a really good question. Well, I think he turns over his hand later on and acknowledges that at least a percent of this is motivated by responding to Twitter. When I read the book, every interaction that, you know, all these hypothetical interactions that are on the internet that you're having with people, I'm just sitting there thinking about my Twitter account. Your Twitter account is nice. What are you talking about? Yeah, I know. Because I, I, there's a lot of things I don't want to respond to, and I just don't. 
I don't, but I, I don't know. Just I see people interact on Twitter in different ways. Like I have, I have been tempted to do things like if I had a bad customer service experience, just to like blow people up on Twitter about it. I've been tempted to do things like that, and I try really hard not to not to do that. Do you give it five minutes when you want to? I give it infinity minutes. <laughs> so that's even more minutes. That's more minutes. Is so. I don't know, just in general, how much do you think this book is a response to Twitter? I think this is a bigger picture response to a meltdown, a breakdown in our ability to communicate, especially with people we disagree with. I think Twitter is one of the vehicles that gets us there because those repugnant cultural others, and we'll get into that more in a minute, used to be a very foreign group of people. You just didn't interact with them. They didn't affect your world. They never made it onto your lawn. But now with social media you have to account for those people. They will see what you wrote and they will reply and it will get weird. And it feels like like where we're at in the evolution of our social brain, we just weren't quite ready for that leap into having the repugnant cultural other right on top of us all the time. And that's why I think the bold language of a survival guide is appropriate. I feel like he's really trying to equip us to do something that we are ill-equipped to do. In the introduction, he references this guy, Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman. I think that's right. And he's this guy who has argued that human thought gets divided up into system one thought and system two thought, and that that system one thought is the intuition, the visceral reaction to stuff, and that system two thought, where we really break things down and think hard, is much more rare, and that a lot of times, if I'm reading it right, that system two thought just deteriorates into using our cold reasoning skills to justify our initial system one reaction. And so Jacobs in the introduction, he interacts with some of these other sociologists. Uh, Jonathan Haidt is another one that um, he touches on a little bit. That's the guy who had the elephant and the, the writer metaphor. And then he says that maybe the problem with some of those models is that we're focusing too much on the science of thinking and forgetting that there is an art to thinking as well. Well, I I think one part that resonated with me is he said, well, when we start to think of the brain as a computer, we're screwing up because it's, it's way more complicated than that. You know, there, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. That's not just ones and zeros coming in and coming out. I mean, there's, there's a lot of subtlety and emotions play in. There's chemical things that happen that are external to the brain that probably affect how your brain works. I mean, there's there's a lot to it. And so I think that's one problem with the science of thinking is is we like to see a flow chart of how things work. And I don't think it's always that simple. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot more nuance into why people make what decisions they do. I've seen super smart people arrive at the wrong conclusion because they've rationalized themselves into that hole. I can think of a ton of examples. I mean, the most notable that I always reference because it's like this, you know, I put this on a shelf so I can look at it, but it's, it's that time I bought that car the Supra that I shouldn't have bought. Yeah. The Supra It's it. I like to think about that because it's like, Oh wow. I can make really big mistakes by not thinking correctly. Yeah. I should have bought the Corolla that the engineer had all the oil change receipts for, for the past 10 years. But instead <laughs> I bought the, the stick shift Supra, that somebody had bought the word turbo and like stuck it on the side. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> yeah. I, I think back to that time because um, that was a moment in time where my thinking was corrupted and it ended up costing me dearly. And so sometimes my goal at this point when I'm thinking is to minimize pain for future destin. <laughs> that's a, I think that's a very noble, high-functioning goal of thought, isn't it? I mean, nothing wrong with that. There's a guy that that I respect, Steve, you know, Steve, Steve Bateman. Oh yeah. He, yeah, he said, I respect him too. There's two main reasons why people do things. One is the antis- anticipation of pain. So they try to avoid it or the anticipation of a pleasure. And, um, that's, those are some really big thoughts that go into people's decision-making process. And so I think sometimes you can make a decision knowing it will cause you pain, especially in the short term, but hopefully it'll it'll help the overall grand scheme, whatever you're trying to do with the world in the long run. Anyway, science and art of thinking. Okay, two thoughts on that. One, the first time I read this book, 
And I mean, it's got to be like in the first four or five pages, he uses the analogy of your system one thought and your system two thought when buying a car. And I laughed out loud thinking of your experience with the Toyota right. Supra, knowing that I was going to have you read this book, <laughs> that he used an example directly ripped from the pages of your life, made me chuckle. But two, so Steve makes that point about anticipation of pleasure or avoidance of pain as being prime motivators in our thinking. How do you think that figures into disagreeing or getting into it with people on the internet? Do we get into it with people on the internet in weird ways because we want pleasure or because we're avoiding pain or is it something else? Oh, I, I think I think he, he picked an excellent example when he went with uh, Megan Phelps Roper when he started talking about, you know, she mm. had the, she grew up in this certain environment uh, for people that haven't read the book. You know, she was part of the Westboro Baptist church movement. And if you don't know what that is, well, do you want to explain that briefly? You probably have a better handle on the, uh, yeah. Westboro Baptist church is somewhere in Kansas. It's a church that is mostly made up of the relatives and descendants of a guy named Fred Phelps. I don't know, do you call him a fundamentalist? That might be mean to fundamentalists. <laughs> uh, this is a dude who just got to a place where his read on the Bible was so bizarrely obsessed with particularly sex, and not just sex, but gay sex. Like that, for whatever reason, of all the things in the Bible, that is the one that jumped off the page and was like, nope, not that one. Which is weird, because like on a list of things that come up, it's it's way, way down there in terms of frequency of mention. But for whatever reason, he felt like this is what is wrecking society. And there would have been some other probably theological assumptions about how this was undercutting God's plan for America. I don't know. The dude turned nasty and he's brilliant. I think he was like a former lawyer or something. Brilliant, strategic dude. And with this tiny little church, he managed to go around and pick fights with basically everyone in the name of their church being the only one that's right. And I had a couple of personal experiences with this church. I don't think you and I have ever discussed this what? before. Have we? You've had personal experiences with Westboro Baptist Church? Yeah. Hold on, let me get some popcorn here. Go. What happened? I worked at a church in Nebraska. Big church. I was like the 15th guy on the totem pole. Like I, I was not important there. But it was a church that was really thriving when I was there, and there was a death in the church of a, a guy who was a very dear friend of mine. Wonderful dude. But he was a guy who liked to ride his motorcycle, and he was a part of something that I think they called the Patriot Guard. And what this Patriot oh, Guard yeah. would do... Oh, you've heard of this? Yeah, so, so when these Westboro Baptist Church people will go and protest a funeral, the Patriot Guard will ride, yeah. and they will stand in between the family who's mourning... And these, uh, I, every word I want to say, I'm not going to say. Nope. These these people that um, that do things at these funerals, and so they they try to stand in the gap there. They kind of form a human shield to protect those who are mourning. Exactly. So this guy was one of those dudes. Yes. So Fred Phelps, you know, Westboro goes around. They do protest funerals, or they did. I don't know what they do now. And part of that was like, they somehow in their brain correlated soldiers dying to some sort of divine retribution for people of the same gender having relationships. I, I don't like, I don't get it. That doesn't sound like the mind of God from the Bible, but whatever. And so these Patriot Guard would do what you said, and my buddy was a part of that group. Well, they kept a list of people who were a part of that Patriot Guard group, and then when they would die... They'd go protest the Patriot Guardsmen's funerals. I was co, I don't know what you call it, officiating this funeral. And we start driving up and we'd heard that Westboro was going to be there. We knew what corner they were going to be on in town. We knew what signs they were going to be holding. And sure enough, there they were. But all of these other gruff biker types turned out and completely box them in. They, they didn't lay hands on them. They, they don't do physical confrontation. And so it was pretty cool to see all of these friends of my buddy stand up to the Westboro bully jerks. But the signs they were holding were just a level of shocking cruelty 
that is one thing to hear about in a news story. It's another thing to be going to mourn the loss of your dear friend and see some clown holding that crap on a street corner. It, it's a nasty group, is the point. It, it hurt. It really does hurt me that they do it in... Uh and they do it supposedly in the name of God. That really hurts me, but whatever. So what I thought was interesting in the choice of Megan Phelps Roper, <clears throat> by the way, excellent story. Oh, yes. That's cool. Did not know that happened. Oh, oh the story I was telling you. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, interesting stuff, I thought. I thought the choice of using Megan Phelps Roper in this book and showing that she turned as a result of an interaction on Twitter that was charitable where someone just interacted with her. I forget the guy's name. Was it Devin or someone? The, he said the problem with Twitter is that people talk back. And so she was tweeting, and then this guy responded to her, and he was charitable, nice. And, you know, hey, he may be wrong, but, you know, he seems nice, and that's hard, and that kind of melted her brain a little bit. And that kind of eventually turned her, and she stopped by making one decision. I thought this was very interesting. And the decision was? To not hold one of the particular signs at the, I, by the way, did you find it shocking that he just wrote all the words in the book? I'm so like grateful that he did. We need to quit being afraid of words. <laughs> we do. Like, I'm cool that you and I are trying to do something that people can listen with kids, that anybody could sit down with their kids and, and listen to. But if you're talking to adults, we need to quit being afraid of words. Things need to be said so we know what we're talking about. I thought it was so cool that he used all the words. Anyway, so. Yeah, takes their power away. Use them. So she had a sign that said, you know, Three words, God hates, and then slur for these people. I think it's a slur. I don't know how that works. And she made a decision. No, 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 no. Something about people dying. I forget what what it was. But she made this decision to quit holding this sign. And it was a an internal decision that she didn't talk about with people in the group. But she goes, you know what? That's just a little line too far. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take one step back from holding that particular sign. Mm-hmm. And that was the beginning of the shift in thought. And even if even if that's all she did, even if she stopped just at quit, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna hold that sign anymore. That just seems mean. That's interesting because the th- you know, the question that Devin asked her was, well, how can these people ever be saved if you kill them? And there were there was not a response to that. So she's like, Okay, well that's illogical. I'm gonna stop doing promoting that. So I I just think it's fascinating. It's a good response. And it's one of those rare times where a good response actually gets through the armor. Yeah. But it, but it starts with one decision, right? She made a decision to not do one of these things that she was doing. And she didn't tell anybody because maybe she was ashamed that other people in her group might not, you know, appreciate her decision. Mm -hmm. So that tells you there was some fear there. So, So let me ask you this, Matt. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you've made this internal decision and you didn't want to tell people around you because it it wasn't, you know, in vogue or whatever, but have you ever done that? Have you ever seen something going on? You're like, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore, or I'm not going to Hmm. laugh at that joke anymore or these types of things. I need permission to nuance. This is going to take just a second. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Because you're asking me about something that's pretty important to me. Well, there are two things you don't have that to get. I you don't have very, to get very too, deeply. You don't have to get too personal if you don't want. That's okay. I, I mean, I can't answer the question without going here, but I'm cool with going here. Okay. There were two things as a young man that I thought very, very deeply. I literally wore a hat that said G O P to college, like the same way I wear a Wyoming hat all the time now. That was my go-to hat. You did? I did. Matt. Yeah. Matt Whitman. Wore a hat that said GOP. Yeah, I just, I just was sure that, I was sure that that was the right team in all situations. Because I was a kid. Do pictures you know, black, white, absolute? Do pictures exist? I mean, just for reference. I mean, I would never use yeah, this. They do. I would never use this on the internet, like you in, in mass. Mm, okay, it's possible. I can't accommodate that. You know what you'll see underneath that GOP hat? Long, flowing, what? golden hair. So, a couple <laughs> so things this changed. was a long time yeah, ago. It was, it was a while back. It was a while back. <laughs> so, nobody brainwashed me into being a loyalist to one political party. And this is where I want to nuance. I'm not saying this to pick a fight with people who really do like that political party. Whatever. I know there's comfort in latching on to a group that has a set of ideas politically 
And sometimes they might have good points and maybe sometimes they don't. It just, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. I'm talking about a shift for me. And well, to be clear, the reason it's so shocking to me is you pride yourself on not being a team picker. Yep. And so the the thought of you wearing a hat saying, I'm, I'm for this side, it, that's just mind blowing to me. Well, and you get it. But anyway, you get go it. Ahead. for me, it's not a rejection of all of my friends who like the grand old party. It's not a rejection of Republican ideas. I think some of the stuff that they think, I suppose. It's a rejection of team picking. It's a rejection of thinking that there is hope and answers in political parties. And that shift was stunning for me as that started to happen in my 20s. I was sure that hope for humankind would come from my slightly fundamentalist brand of Christianity uh, in a spiritual sense, in an eternal sense, and that hope for the world and getting society straightened out would come through my political party. In both situations, my exclusive team would be what fixed it. And so I used my words and my brain to out-argue people, most of whom didn't even want to have an argument, to demonstrate the superiority of my team's ideas. And I, I needed that more for me than I did for other people. And, and so where the change happened was I started to lose confidence in that. And there was a moment, and this is what you were asking me for, there was a moment where it occurred to me, uh, I might just be a partisan hack. And I can tell you exactly when it was. It was when um, it was when Bill Clinton got impeached. I really wanted that to happen. I really needed that to happen because I thought he was a you know a bad guy and a bad man, and maybe he is, maybe he's not. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of presidents or politicians in general. but I needed the wrong of Bill Clinton being elected to be undone and for my team to win that battle. It came very late in the game. And it felt like it would be so satisfying for that to be straightened out. And then it happened. And it was the first time the Pandora's box principle had ever occurred to me in my entire life. And I was like, wait a oh, minute. The, the, the fact that if they do that, if I do this to their team, when my people aren't in power, they're just going to do it to me. Why wouldn't they do it back? Yeah. And you know what happened two years later? The hanging Chad election. And I mean, maybe if there's no impeachment... Maybe people are more reasonable about that, but instead... To, to be clear for the younger listeners, so that's when Al Gore and George W. Bush were mm -hmm. uh, running for president against each other, mm -hmm. and it came down to Florida, and uh, in that election, there was some question about particular ballots in the state of Florida, and they had this special voting system where you'd punch a hole in paper... Mm -hmm. And if it didn't punch it all the way through, this Chad is what the word was for the little hole that leaves the paper that was hanging in there. And so there was some question about those votes, and it went all the way to the top. Oh, it went nuts. People were, election officials were trying to gauge how seriously people meant to vote for one candidate or another based on how hard the paper looked like it had been punched. It was like a forensic analysis of a handful of ballots in two Broward and Dade County crazy so the the other time in our history where we had a deeply disputed election was 1876 between hilden hilden tilden and hayes and what do you know that's right in proximity with the civil war another very divided time and so for me i was very uh troubled when i realized that i had been one of the cheering voices in the gallery to open this Pandora's box. And as soon as it was open, I wanted it back closed and realized this is, this is bad. This is going to hurt everyone. The hope is not in one of these two teams. The hope is in somehow working beyond these two teams on a certain agreed upon set of principles. And so for me, I can point right to when I shifted from strongly partisan to kind of rejecting the whole idea of partisanship being the way that we solve things. And can I uh, can can I give you a, a more trivial, yet equally personal, yeah moment for me? That's what we're doing, please. So, you know, I, I'm all about I'm all about um, preserving the earth. I mean, I don't have a recycling bin at my house because they don't offer that in my in my county. But you know, if there's an option, I always go out of my way to do it. Right. 
Okay. Another thing I like are straws. I really, really <laughs> like straws a lot. Okay. This sounds dumb. This sounds dumb, but just roll with me here. I'm rolling. Um, I like... I, I like the straws because I can put my finger over the top of it and pull the liquid up, and then I can remove my thumb, and I can watch the liquid go down and back up, and I get to think about the oscillation frequency of the liquid and the momentum. Yeah, me too. There's a thing called Bernoulli's equation that I get to do in my head. I can't do it in my head, but I get to think about it in my head. I've heard of that one. You ever do that? Yeah. You, you pull the. It's, it's different than what you think. It's the momentum equation, but you, you, you kind of let the liquid out of the straw, and it goes down into the bottom of your drink and then it goes beyond the surface of the 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 liquid and then it bounces back up and it oscillates till it dithers out till it's it's even. Yeah. Anyway, I took a lot of classes on fluid dynamics and I love playing with straws. I saw a video on the internet of a sea turtle. Have you seen this video? I've not. They have the sea turtle um it, it's some conservation wildlife type folks, um, wildlife conservationists. I don't know what they call themselves, but they have this sea turtle and they're holding him down and, and like he's hurting. There's something wrong. And then they go up and somebody has a pair of pliers and they reach into his nose and they pull out the straw from the sea turtle's nose. The whole thing. It comes out lengthwise. Ugh. You can't see the straw and then the whole thing comes out. And this turtle like sneezes or something. I forget what it was. And I was like, Holy crap. Why am I why am I using single use plastic? Why am I doing that? Where does it go? And I started thinking about it. I was like, this is bizarre. Why why like right now on the desk that I'm I'm at, I have two literal glasses. Those are glass. Proof. Yeah, but um down here below, I've got a, a plastic where's that? Yeah, you got this plastic bottle of water and um this wasn't the first time that it occurred to me that my use of plastic could be harmful i was in honduras a long time ago and um this we were on, on top of this mountain in this village and they didn't have power or anything and this guy looks at me and says hey you see that kid right there i was like yeah he's asking you if you want to go see his water source i was like yeah yeah i'd love to and so this kid we start running through the woods, and, you know, about like a quarter of a mile later, we're at this spring that's coming out of the, the side of the mountain, and he, he has this bottle, this two-liter bottle that he's clearly used to get water out of the spring, you know, hundreds of times. I was like, holy cow, I throw that bottle away every time I use it. And he has used that same bottle hundreds of times. And he's providing water for his family with it. What am I doing? I don't know. So internally, my mind is shifting on this topic. And I can feel uh, every time I use a single-use plastic device, I feel this tension happening. And I, I don't know why. I, I mean, I, I do know why, because it's dumb for me to get a plastic bag at the grocery store, and ultimately my kids are going to have to deal with that. You know, it, that's 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 the way my brain is shifting. I, I said <laughs> it's dumb, and what I'm trying to articulate here is I'm starting to feel like it's dumb. Repugnant cultural other. Do you have one? Uh, Yeah, probably. I don't, I mean... You want to not say? Yeah, I want to not say. I do. Um, okay. I get lured into a lot of fights. Um, pe people want to... I don't know. I, I will say this. It was very interesting for me. So I've had the opportunity, as you know, to speak to face-to-face -face with both President Obama and Ivanka Trump. And yeah, I, I'm a pretty in-the-middle-of-the-road kind of person. And the way each of those sides reacted to me doing that. For example, when I spoke to Obama, I got a lot of noise from the right. When I spoke to Ivanka Trump, I got a lot of noise from the left. The way that went down was very different. And um, it was not the same type of conversation in both directions. It was, uh, I don't know, one of them... What, what do you mean? Like one of the groups who was angry, when, when one group took their turn being angry at you, it had a different flavor than when the opposite group took their turn being angry. At it you? was personal. Yeah, it was personal. And um, 
they, they, they were like, oh, wow, hmm. I didn't want to have to crucify Destin, but I guess we need to. Where's the hammer and nails? <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. Wow. I was like, that's amazing. And so uh, I just kind of took it on the chin and kept going. But uh, it was uh, it was interesting and bizarre. And so I think in general, the people that I would say are the repugnant cultural others are the ones that just don't have goodwill towards other people on the Internet. I, I try to think mm. about how I'm serving other people. I try to do that, and people that don't do that, and they seem very, very self-centered, and I'm going to yell really loudly at everybody right now. That's I do not like that. What is so tricky is that it feels like that is a valid, repugnant, cultural other because of how demonstrably damaging that behavior is, but we can't have peace on the Internet without those people. What do you, we need them. What do you mean? I mean, we need them. I mean, you got to fight with somebody at your job. You got to fight with somebody at your church. And you want things to be better. You need your enemy. They hold the keys or at least half of the keys to peace. And so it's become, I think, it's very natural for me to want to do the thing where I just wash my hands of people who I think are really mean-spirited. But at the same time, how much better would stuff be if if goodwill wins out over me when I'm fussy and difficult on the internet or over those who make a habit of being fussy and difficult on the internet. So this whole proposition of surviving a world at odds or maybe even helping a world at odds be a little less at odds, it it, it doesn't involve the eradication of the repugnant cultural other it involves somehow understanding and things getting better between us and our repugnant cultural other. So I'm calling the, I'm so calling the bull crap flag on you here because in the book, he talks about the fact that if he said something that people disagreed with and they tried to just freak out on him, he said he admitted to starting a personal Twitter account and having only about 100 mm-hmm. people go follow him there so that he could interact in a productive way. And so... What Notice you're we saying, invited. <laughs> what you're saying, and what he's saying is very different. I think it's not. I think we're talking about two different levels of Zoom. I'm not saying don't mute people. I'm saying ultimately, though, if we want this thing to be better, that huge percentage of people in society who like to push the nuclear option whenever they can and just melt down emotionally over disagreement in front of people, like. Yeah, we we need that to change. I mean, you can't kill them, and you don't want to. You can't send them away, and you shouldn't want to. Like, what you want is a better relationship. And so if we want this thing to be better, we have to find a way to break through to each other and to our repugnant cultural others on on some level. Now, I think what Jacobs is talking about is not quite so macro as this save the world, make everything better you know, maybe overly dramaticism that I'm engaging in right now. I think what he's talking about is himself and surviving in a world at odds. And what he figured out is that that behavior was drawing crap out of him. Remember he talked about like his hand shaking and being unable to type because he was so angry about what people said over this or that issue on the interwebs. Can can I say something? I think what he's talking about is insulating himself. You can say lots of (laughs) somethings. So if let's just think about that. He's talking about his hands shaking over the keyboard. I thought when it, when he said that, it, it kind of struck home a little bit because he was talking about reading someone else's article and the things they were saying are just angry and evil or whatever. He, maybe he didn't. Those aren't his words. I just made something up. But you know what I'm trying to say. Just. What sure. you yeah. do and what I do, very, very different. You turn a camera what do you on mean? your face... You record your face saying things with your mouth hole. I know the one. And then you think through things, and you try really hard to be graceful and respectful, and then you upload those to the internet. And then thousands of people watch that, and they scroll down two swipes on their on their touchpad, and they get to the comment section. And then they you know, either say, hey, good job, or... Who are the people that are most motivated to leave comments, typically? 
the ones that want to rip you a new one, man. That, yeah. And so, not really with uh, with your crowd on 10 Minute Bible Hour. People are very graceful there, but... It's a good group. I mean, on Smarter Every Day, Smarter Every Day dude, I, I get, you know, systematically destroyed often. And so, when he was sitting there talking about his hands shivering above the keyboard because he was angry, and that's when he starts talking about take the five minutes... Dude, that's my life. <laughs> so, and you almost always take the five minutes. I've just, you call me sometimes, and I am the five minutes. Well, I don't. I just don't engage. Yeah, but sometimes I it just hurts. Do you. not engage. Sometimes it hurts you to the point oh, where yeah, we can. get on the phone and we game it out. But usually it doesn't. Like what? When does it hurt me that I've gamed it out with you? Uh, okay, I'll throw this out here. If we want to redact it later, we can. The one that sure. really stands out to me was. Someone talking about a personal interaction they had with you where they described you as just basically being a jerk to them. Not like evil to them, just mean and dismissive and, you know, oh, never meet oh, your yeah. heroes kind of thing. And there was I no evidence and no data. And it, yeah, it hurt you. And we spent a long time gaming that out. I do remember that because I, I'm like 99% sure it did not happen. But they threw it out there on the internet for the world to see, and I'm like, what the heck? What, I mean, what do you do? Yeah, I remember that now that you say that. Thank you for bringing it up. And so, I mean, I can remember another time where uh, one of my children, they we were in public, and um, this person comes up and introduces himself, and then one of my kids had this major health issue happen immediately, and it had to be addressed immediately. And, you know, the person has their hand out to shake it. And I just had to be like, I'm so sorry. I have to be a dad. I have to go now. And um, I remember that happening. I remember thinking that person probably thinks I'm whatever. But, is it, yeah, it is important to me that, um, that, that I'm at peace with everyone. But, yeah, you're right. I remember that. And, uh, yeah, that one hurt because I think it was a lie. Yeah. My point is what we're doing is very, very different than what Jacobs is doing here, I think. Because we very much put ourselves on the internet. He's done a very good job of isolating himself. Which is why he isn't, or one of the reasons why he isn't on this program with us right now. You know, I was going to look him up and ask him to just jump on, make a few connections. Right. And like the thing that he has up right now is, hey, if you want me to be on your podcast or your thing, look me back up in 18 more months. My family has asked me <laughs> to shut it down for a while. <laughs> so, so I never asked out of respect to that request. Um. But yeah, I, I, we're doing slightly different things than him. His is maybe a little more deliberate. It's just a different medium, right? Like He's maybe not making a video, but he wrote this book we're discussing. It has a pretty big reach. My point is, I, I know what it's like to feel like you've been personally attacked and uh, just take it. I know what that's like. Yeah, me too. And um, people, don't, people don't think about the asymmetry of... Uh, of, of the social media world, you know, mm. I'm not saying YouTube, I'm just saying the social media world in general. Like if you can, if you can rally a bunch of people around an idea that you don't like, then you, I mean, suddenly you can have tens of thousands of voices screaming at a, an individual that was just going about their life doing something, you know, it's, it's interesting how the gain uh, to use electric circuit terminology, the gain can be amplified very, very quickly. I think everybody who does what we do is a little bit concerned that someday those crosshairs are going to be steadied on us. Whether it's justified or not, it's just such a yucky thing to imagine going through. It is. It is. And I try to <laughs> I try to be squeaky clean in both my personal life and my and my my public life. Well, and honestly, it's a little easier for you because you're a decent dude. That helps. You don't have to do a lot of faking it and a lot of acting. And the times when I see you maybe be a little bit more difficult than others, it's fairly trivial. Can I ask you an unrelated question from this intro? Bring it. Do you have a refutation mode? Do you feel like there's a switch in your brain that goes from conversation to refute, like what Jacobs was describing? I don't know that I do. Hmm. I, I maybe have it mentally, but I usually don't 
outwardly. Well, no, no, this is all wrong. I do. I totally do. I, uh, I don't know. It's just not combative, I don't think. I don't know. You've got me thinking. I'm doing that thing where I cock my head to the side and I'm looking off in the corner of the room. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not accusing or suggesting you do. I, I was, I wanted to ask you, you the question do, without any prompting because I, I really want to know what you think. I, I try very, very hard to see all sides of the argument. And often when I'm having a discussion with someone, I'm, I'm honestly trying to see it from their side. And sometimes, I don't know, I fight with you a lot. And uh, we, we kind of do the kabuki theater thing where we try to right. get on opposite sides of an argument just to, to help each other understand the argument. Like the synthesizer versus guitar thing? Oh, dude, the internet did not understand that. <laughs> but that's what it was, right? Like, you yeah, were so trying to bait so me it, into uh, engaging with you and debating with you? Well, in the last... Okay, in the last episode, I asked you why guitars still existed. I thought it was clear what I was doing, but apparently it wasn't. So, I don't know. I can say it. People won't believe it. What I was trying to do is I was trying to put you in the position, because I know you love guitar... I was trying to tell you that all a guitar does is make music that we can replicate with other devices. But we all know it's more than that. And so what I did is I built up this question in terms of saying, why do guitars still exist? I can do all this information with, you know, just by understanding engineering and science. I can pluck a string and all this stuff. So why does a physical guitar have to still exist? And what I was trying to do, poorly I assume, is get you to describe those things about a guitar that you can't see and you can't feel, but you know it's the art and it's the human element and all that stuff. So by putting you in the position where you had to defend that, it would help you articulate the argument better, and it would ultimately help us all get to the heart of why guitars are important. What the internet heard is (laughs) Destin's a robot engineer who hates music. (laughs) Would you agree with yeah. that? And then we went on to talk about a bunch of different music that you like with yeah. banjo Appalachian stings in between. <laughs> did Did you read the comments though? In, oh yeah. Like I mean, I've read it and everything. Well, I mean, for crying out loud, there was a possum loose in your house and the subreddit was dominated by the guitar conversation. It's got to be something really salacious to not talk about that possum. So I think that's a did home you see run the, right uh, there. Did you see like the the church choir lady that said she got so mad she had to walk away from the podcast? Did you see that one? Yeah, I don't remember her name. I interact with her a lot on Twitter, and she's a really uh-huh. nice, really nice level-headed lady <laughs> who says smart yeah. things on Twitter. So I was like, whoa, I've never seen that side from her. I think uh, I think you pushed I the think button, that's Mr. You, Sandlin. <laughs> that's when you picked up the phone and you're like, we got to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> the The thing about it is, Okay, you didn't brief me. You said I'm going to hit you with something cold as part of this episode, and everything else we briefed each other on before we that got into the that. That was the only thing I, di- I didn't prepare you on, and you understand right. why I didn't prepare you on that, right? Well, and I maybe you got the reaction you wanted, maybe you didn't, but I didn't know. I didn't know what you were doing. I caught on about halfway through, and I know your dance steps really well in terms of the way we jab each other and rivet each other, and so you threw that out, and I listened, and I internalized, and I was like what the heck you know dang what you know dang well what is this and then i i went this and this is where it all ties back i flipped into refutation mode and i i know that tone and there's like this sane level-headed let me flesh out this argument tone that i take that i think is is effective i think it's decent it could improve but it's decent And then there's this other one that I get into where I'm a little tiny bit miffed and I'm not joking. And so that clumsy apology that you got at the end of all of that discussion about guitar in the last episode was not that I was upset for disagreeing with you. I wasn't upset at all. Uh, What I was disappointed in myself for was how quickly I hit the refutation mode switch and I had this book's words ringing in my ear and I was like, I just got to say something. I got to acknowledge that I went into defensive mode over a question about guitars and robot music. That's not something I should be defensive about. It's dumb. Disagreeing with you is fine. My initial response and the emotion that went with it, I didn't like that. So so what do you think my opinions on guitars are? You love guitars. (laughs) You, You love music for crying out loud. I know this about you. 
I don't know. It suddenly, like it, you were just I acting think it, better than usual, or what? But I, I missed it at but first. Here, here, here's the deal. The ultimate goal was to help us all think about what that beautiful thing about a guitar is, right? And like, what is that thing that you can't really articulate about music that's done with a human strumming? And if you go look at the internet, it is covered with comments about it now. So we know the answer to that. (laughs) Well, for future reference, I think it's okay to get to the end and be like, hey, obviously this is an exercise to put you in a spot where you have to describe why you're passionate about something you're passionate about. But for whatever reason, we got sidetracked and just didn't do that turn over the cards part. It was a grappler, dude. It was a grappler. There was grappling. What can you do? I have a reputation mode. I know what it sounds like. I hate it when it's happening. And what brings it out the most is when someone challenges one of my most basic moral assumptions about life in the larger world, and that is that people own their own bodies and their own words and their own ideas, and that it's wrong to try to infringe on other people's self-ownership. To me, that is so morally clear that I will take a tone I don't like. I, I'm I'm calm, but I'm just not as cool as I want to be sometimes when I talk about that with people. And I, I hate it. And when he started talking about reputation mode, I was like, I know. I know what it is because I have that. I got to do better. What, what did you make of the story about the visit to the doctor that ended with the doctor saying, sometimes the diagnosis is the cure? Do you remember that one? This was actually super important to me because, um, so what he said is he had this pain in his chest. Yeah. And he thought it was something else and it it made him really anxious and stuff like that. And he started freaking out. And the fact that he was freaking out made, made him strain that muscle more. And it was like this cycle, this cycle that just mm-hmm. fed off of itself. And he kind of spiraled down and he thought all these bad things. I, I know someone that's done something like this recently. And when the doctor says, Hey, you pulled a muscle in your chest and he's like, well, what, what do you like? What do you do? He's like, well, the diagnosis is the cure. You know that it's not something crazy now. You're not going to die. Yep. So I just know. chill. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that was very, very interesting. And so what that means is once you know, I don't know. So, can we just admit you're talking about me? <laughs> the, no, we're not. I actually wasn't talking about you, but that happened to you, you too, serious? didn't it? When I was in Alabama. No. Yeah, I was like... No, I'm not... You really weren't talking, talking about, about you. I'm talking right about there. someone. No, oh, I was that's talking so about somebody funny. else. Because for me, the yeah. first time I'd ever experienced the diagnosis was the cure is that night I called you when I was down there. And I was like, hey, dude, like this hurts. I feel really weird. And we debated whether or not to go and get it checked out. And then we did. And the doctor's like, yeah, you... You got, you pulled a muscle, you pulled a pectoral muscle and you just need to relax and not work out and take it easy and it'll feel better. Oh, oh, so I can relax. And then I felt better. How'd you pull your pectoral muscle, Matt? What do you mean? I don't, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what I'm saying. It might have been a several hundred push up a day challenge that I took from the internet and did for two months and then hurt my pectoral muscle trying to catch up on missed days on the last day of the challenge. So I could say I did it. That might be what happened. (laughs) There you go, man. (laughs) I think I did it wrong. (laughs) There you go. No, I I think, um, I think being self-aware is incredibly important. And and that's the biggest thing this book did for me. I'm not going to say that I'm self-aware now, but it helped me be more self-aware about the shortcomings and, and how I interact with other people. Hmm. It's certainly, it's interesting. It's almost like it's put me on the defense and the person I'm defending myself from is myself. So that's interesting. It it kind of puts different checks and balances into how you interact with the world, which is probably good. I think that's the mark of a good book. I mean, this, this book is not written, it's not predicated on some religious assumption um i don't know it's certainly not the, with the words it used <laughs> uh no no i think it's predicated <laughs> on use the assumption these words that truth is good and that people have value 
I think those are two foundational assumptions behind this book. You think that's a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah, I'd roll with that. It's interesting how often those two things that I think everybody would assent to come into conflict. Truth is important and people have value. It's easy to have one of those assumptions play out in my life at any given time. It can be very hard to have both. Yeah, I agree. I hit you with a bunch of questions I had from the introduction side. Why don't you give me some of the stuff you have from the rest of the book? Oh, dude. I, so what I did is as, as I was going through here, I came up with a series of questions and uh, just observations that I think were worth talking about. And, you know, the first one we already talked about, the is this a whole response to Twitter? I think that's a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. One thing that I, I thought was interesting is the false we when he mentioned the false we, like, we need to do this. It's just yeah. another way of saying, I need you to do this because I'm uh-huh. doing it already. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like I'm language from, this. what was it, the name of the characters? The Bobs? Was that it? On uh, Office Space? I don't, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm guilty of that, actually. When I say, you know what we really need to do? That's me saying, hey, I've got this figured out. You guys don't. <laughs> So, yeah, that's something we can do a better job of. Yeah. Um, I really, You're just going to really, let really that really go? <laughs> yeah, we can. Okay. Oh, right. you were saying... Uh, I oh, met you. <laughs> dude, you're, you're a deeper thinker than I am. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, so here's another thing that I really enjoyed. The story about the political union, the, the Yale Political Debate Club or yes. whatever it was. Okay. And the question was, we counted in converts. Like, when you can win somebody over to your way of thinking, not just in the debate that you've been assigned for the night, but, like, for realsies. And what I really liked was the idea of breaking on the floor. They said, if you were to break someone on the floor, that means you were to change their mind for realsies, like in real life, right there on the spot. And the question that they would ask you before you join this club is, have you ever broken someone on the floor? And uh, that's like a sign of achievement. But then the other question they asked of is, have you ever been broken on the floor? I thought that was fascinating. That is what my friend Mark referenced from this book that, that got us talking about this, this whole how to think project. That struck him in the same way. Have you been broken on the floor? Well, to be clear, before we before we move forward with that, you want to say yes to that question. Have you been broken on the floor? Because if the answer is no, then that means you think you know all the answers outright. Yeah. yeah. But if someone is trying to convince you of something and you, at some point in your life, you go, you know what? They're right and I'm wrong. I should change the way I think about it. I mean, that's important. Um, yes, I've been broken on many things. I told you about the uh, the lightning story a long time ago, right? Mm, jog my memory. Long story short, um, it was a blue sky. The safety officer drove down range, <sighs> told me to get off the tower. Oh, oh yeah, we talked. I said, as that was unfolding, we talked. Yeah. And um, I pointed at the sky and I said, you're wrong, I'm right. I was like, there's yeah. nothing wrong here. Uh, I need to get that equipment off that tower before the storm gets here. And he said, get down now. And we had a very, I mean, it's, it was a direct confrontation and he was superior. And so I did what he said. And then, but as I did what he said, you know, I had a couple of things to say as I was getting in my truck and driving off just to let him know that I was right. And then that night someone was struck by lightning and killed the following day. When I figured that out, it was a 180, 100% turnaround on everything. And I, I walked in his office and said, I need to apologize to you. And um, I was like, not only to you, I need to do this in front of our boss. <laughs> so, so I need you to go to the boss with me, and I need to apologize to you in front of the boss. And uh, that's what I did. And it was the right thing to do. It was the only right thing to do. That's broken on the floor. Dude, big time. And so... Um, would you have done it if that person hadn't been struck by lightning? Uh, I don't know if I would have learned the lesson. Because you were wrong either way. 
yeah, I was wrong either way. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's an excellent that's an excellent point, and that tells me I have more to think about myself. You know, it, I have more to analyze internally, but I don't know. I mean, that that's certainly the thing that shook me into into realizing that I was not on the side of truth. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, it hurt. You ever been broken? Yeah, that's why I became an atheist for a while. Oh, yeah? Yep. I mean, this comes up a lot in our conversations, but I had vigorously used my brain to defend very difficult to defend positions on religious issues in my 20s and even going into seminary, which is where where you're going to get trained in this stuff. And it was just working less and less and less. And I knew it was. And it was like that, uh, that David guy who was talking with Phelps Roper where (laughs) she knew something wasn't quite working. And I had a couple of things like that where I was having a conversation with a student, uh, one of my students, and they were asking fair questions and I was treating them as other questions weren't fair to protect myself with little concern for their well-being or growth. And in mid-conversation, uh, I just realized that I was wrong. Not about the existence of God or anything like that, about specifics of my behavior-oriented theologies and how I thought everyone else needed to act. Then that started a cascade effect of my faith just out and out breaking. And like obviously, as you know, my faith um, exists again, but in a different form. It is, it's never returned to what it was before, and I don't, I don't want it to. That version needed to be broken on the floor. And that was very hard to admit, and in fact, I admitted it to almost no one because I was really embarrassed. So did you quit protesting funerals at that time in your life? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for bailing me out on all of that. What, <laughs> what, the what, right sign, to go to what sign did you refuse to hold up after that? <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> anyway, that's pretty good. Two words that I learned in this book that okay. I think were very interesting. Um, neophilic and neophobic. You either love things that are new and change, or you hate it, yeah. or you're you know you're opposed to it. I, I did not know those two words, and it made me think about whether I'm neophilic or neophobic. What, what are you? It depends on what we're talking about. If the new idea doesn't run through my filter of the pluralistic human ethic, um in a good way, then I don't like the new idea. So in other words, if the new idea means now other people own your body and what you think and what you do, then I'm really instantly resistant to it. But new ideas that don't really threaten people or infringe on people, uh, I tend to be curious at worst, quick to adopt at best. What about you? I don't like your answer. Well, okay. All right, fine. What do you want it to be? I think you're, I think you're neophilic. I think you adopt new things pretty quickly. Most? Um, yeah. But I don't think you would call yourself neophobic if, if you decide not to go with the trend. I don't think that's what these terms mean. Like, if you see something new, what's your first response to it? Ask hmm, questions. I should, I should evaluate this. Right. Mm-hmm. Your, your first response to something new isn't, oh, heck no. You know, no, you're no, not, you're I'm not, not a against Luddite. things just because they're new. Right. I think that's what the, the word means. Okay. That's fair. Okay. In, in, in my estimation, I think I'm pretty neophilic. Yeah. You're an early adopter. Mm-hmm. I, I like to, I like to try new things. I think it's, it's interesting. So cool. Um, here's another question I had. I just want to talk about the inner ring. He references C.S. Lewis's inner ring, the people that actually, control things. And I asked you earlier in the week if the governor of Wyoming has power. Do they? Huh. A little. Who's the inner ring in Wyoming? I think there is money in Wyoming and some old families. And I think that is where the real seat of power happens. Um, I couldn't put a name to it. But I don't think, I don't think Cheyenne is all that powerful. I think there are more powerful forces at work 
maybe not for evil, but more powerful forces at work beyond the Capitol building. So I think this is a grand, uh, you know, very on the surface reading of what he means by the inner ring. But I think there's this other thing. Do you want to be the person that's in on the jokes? There's these people that just do things and you know, they're the ones that get things done and they make decisions and their decisions tend to stick when other decisions tend to not stick. It's almost like the, have you heard of Pareto, the Pareto analysis? Mm, 80% 80 of the work is done by 20% of the people. Oh, I I think I've heard of that, but by a different name, but okay. Yeah. I understand the principle. Yeah. I kind of think the Pareto stuff lines up here, not just with getting stuff done, but with this weird social structure and how humans work. I think there's something to that. And the desire to be on that inner circle can corrupt quickly. Because and I you want love to be on the, the way, in crowd. I love the way Jacobs extends that to in-group and out-group language. If you want to be in the inner circle, you learn the code and you try it out. And then he gave those examples of him trying it, but it kind of sucking. Like the Rush Limbaugh joke that he tried. Do you remember that uh, yep. little anecdote? With his dad. Yeah, and, and I, I won't even ask you because I'm sure we both have plenty of examples of us trying it out. Like, hey, what about that thing? And then you don't score any points. And man, that's weird. But when you apply that to thinking about things that have actual implications and online conversation, that can get pretty dang weird. You you got where thought should be happening. Instead, you have catchphrases that signal, I'm a part of this group. I, I want the inner ring acceptance. Because look, I, I said the phrase. I knew what phrase to say when those people say that. Take me in. Take me in. It's, oh, like a dog whistle? Yeah, it's desperate. I mean, it's... My, Mike Ragnetta has this... Uh, th- there's this podcast called Reasonably Sound, and he has a yeah. an episode on a dog whistle. And it's it's a term that you use to signal to all these other people that you're in and you understand, you know, on the surface, this doesn't sound like a bad word, but what I really mean is to create these visual images in your mind when I say it so that you know I'm on the in crowd and, and I think like you. It's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and anyway. no group has the market cornered on that. doesn't matter what ideology you're talking about. That phenomenon seems to exist. I also thought it was interesting he said that you'll be attracted to ideas that are held by people you're attracted to. I thought that was I interesting. Think that's I'm not talking true. like... Yeah, I'm not talking about like, oh, man... That person's smoking hot. I want to think like them. I, no, I just, you know, the people that seem to have their lives together, you're like, I want to be like them. Hmm, yeah. What do they think? Well, or the college freshman phenomenon that I think he alluded to a little bit. This this professor with the patches on his elbows, he doesn't think the same stuff as my stuffy dad. This is the first person who's ever treated me like I have my own thoughts and Take that, Dad. And he's he says swears in class. What? He's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and I think we all experience that a little bit, which, you know, I like my dad. And I probably didn't need to feel that, but I probably did a little bit. Like, ah, oh, these guys kind of get it. And theoretically you move past it. But I'm just saying anybody who would think they're above that phenomenon can maybe picture those moments in their life and be like, uh, yeah, I've been there. This is a part of the the book that was very important to me. Um, the, the last okay. chapter where he talks about the sunk cost fallacy, that was important. But this wow. is the other group, this is the other moment that was really important to me. He says, I don't think you understand the group that you're disagreeing with. Or I don't believe you understand, how did he say it? Do you have that page? I don't have the page, but I know what you're talking about. I don't and, believe and- you understand the group you think you're disagreeing with. That's mm-hmm. the way he said it, I believe. And so this whole idea of be able to articulate the opposing side's argument to their liking before you move forward in yeah. debate or conversation, dude, that's hardcore. Yeah. Have you tried I, it since re- you read this? Have you done it? Um, I try to do it at times. One thing Christopher Hitchens was great at is sometimes he could articulate the argument of the other side better than they could. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's very disarming. And so the so what you're saying is, you know, that kind of moment, 
but it's actually better than what you mean to say. And you're like, oh, yeah, actually, oh, yeah. I yeah. am. I am saying that. Yeah, that of course. Thing. Those. <laughs> yeah, those are the words I would say. And then if it's clear you understand and then you systematically uh, destroy that argument, not in a combative way, but just intellectually to, to help both of you process it out. That's interesting. That is an interesting way to engage in, I don't even want to say debate, just conversations with people that are trying to arrive at truth. I Gaming love that. It out. Me yeah. too. And I yeah. think in that little nugget, and I'm glad that stood out to you because it, it did to me as well. In that little nugget is maybe for me one of the biggest take homes for something I can do different and better if I actually want to help, if I want to be in the, a drop in the bucket of good instead of just griping and moaning all the time about how bad the conversation is and, oh, it's so toxic, that is tangible. I can do that. I can bend over backwards to understand my enemy, my opponent, the person I disagree with, whatever you want to call it, to understand their idea and to say, I respect you simply by getting and restating their idea. And I don't see, like, like I was saying earlier, you need the people you disagree with if you want the world to be better. You need them to come around to some extent, not to your idea, but to some kind of truce. I mean, you, you were suing for peace in a way. And what better way to do that than to have your enemies know that you care about their well-being? Nobody cares about their enemies' well-being. I don't care about my enemies' well-being, not nearly enough. You look at how politics are now, and it is scorched earth. You did this to us. We're going to win, and then we're going to do it right back to you. And what if somebody ran on a platform of how their election will affect those who don't vote for them? I think that'd be amazing. And so I, I just I've love o- the think outside yourselfness of that point. I, I've often fantasized about being president. I, I, I'm sure everybody does at some point. They think about, well, what if I was president? What would it look like if a president is elected and then when they get to pick their cabinet, they pick people from the other party. It happens. What would that do? Yeah. You have to do it better than it's been done in the past. Until very recently, that was actually a, a pretty strong tradition that you go out and grab a couple of people from the other party and put them on your cabinet. It's fallen out of vogue very recently. Really? Mm-hmm. I, I wasn't enough in, in the know to know that that was a thing. Yeah, building in that negative feedback into the system, because that's ultimately what our government is, well, let's put it this way, it's ultimately what the American government is designed to be, is cumbersome and slow. That's interesting. I would um, love, okay, so, I, I fantasize about the uh, the campaign process and being in those debates. And if I did it, I would love to have the opportunity in a closing statement to be like, hey, I know that however this plays out, a ton of you watching this are not going to vote for me. And I want to talk to you about what's going to happen if I win and how I'm going to think of you and how I'm going to treat you. And I would just like to spell out a really honest ethic of, I care about you. And I care about me when people I don't vote for get elected. So I'd be wondering this if I were you. And here very tangibly is how I'm going to treat you. And very tangibly, these are things that I will do and these are things that I will never do. And my hope would be that if elected, I will be your favorite leader that you didn't vote for ever. That'd be fun. Why don't you move That'd to Alabama fun. and we'll play paper, rock, scissors, and whoever wins gets to run for lieutenant governor, and whoever <laughs> loses has to run for governor. <laughs> you know what? I think we could do some damage in the good kind of way. But the only well, thing the in my thing is, up is that I won't run for office. Well, that can be changed. I, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I don't know. I'll take the manatee hostage or something don't and change Camilla's mind. brought up the sunk cost thing and that was the other one that 
really stood out to me from the whole book. What did you make of really? that? Really? You're going to you're going to jump to chapter 5 and you're going to you're going to go right past bulverism, which I don't know what that means. I was going to ask you about that. You're going to go right past <laughs> okay. Luther and what Luther said to Moore. He said, like, <laughs> did this really happen? Did Martin Luther actually write <laughs> dear little I'm not going to say what he called the pope who licks the devil's <laughs> Did he really write that? That sounds like Luther. Uh, I don't Luther remember reading like that? that phrase, but I've read enough Luther to know that is a that's a believable quote. In his old age, he got like cantankerous and mean. He didn't was he? cantankerous in his not old age. Really? Yeah. And so when yeah. when you think Martin Luther, you think like, oh, there's this guy that you know just I don't know. After the printing press happened, he just went crazy and started doing a bunch of. You know stuff, but he wrote like that, and he's viewed as a religious leader of of the Protestant Reformation. Well, there were different norms associated with language. The Victorian. Let me era. paint a picture. Let me okay, paint a picture for you right now. Okay. So, the Southern Baptist Convention is convening at the Opryland Hotel or something. I'm just making all this up. That'd be a nice place to have it. Okay. And so the president of the convention, whoever that, I don't even know who it is, walks up to the podium and says, we have a prepared statement by <laughs> Brother Jeffrey Hankel. Uh, Brother Jeffrey, come on up here and read this uh, statement. And he's like, okay, here we go. And he goes, and, and let's say he just identifies a politician or something, and he wants to, he goes, we have uh, we are passing a resolution that <laughs> Senator what's his name licks the devil's. <laughs> Your southern accent is so believable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like that is some f- strong, strong verbiage, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, I cannot believe Martin Luther did that. <laughs> what was naughty and nice in terms of things to say was a little bit different at that point. But here's the thing, that whole Protestant Reformation era, I, you were, you had people arguing against an establishment that was more deeply rooted than anything ever, maybe in the history of Europe. And the belief that both parties had toward the other, that they were willy nilly condemning anyone who would follow them to a life of eternal punishment after they die it it made them real real mad and they killed each other for a long time to the tune of maybe 600,000 people in the 30 years war it, all, that all ended i'm saying ugly. all i'm saying dude is that makes these really nasty political debates and campaigns of today look not quite as bad as i thought it was so people have been mean to each other for a long time that's the point i think that was jacob's point you just wanted to say licks the devil <laughs> I was, all I was that, happy that, that whole put, segment was just for that purpose. I just can't believe it was in there. And Martin Luther wrote it. Did not know that. Yeah. He also wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Think about that Which next is time amazing. you're singing it. Why would you say that to me? The Pope lives on the Never yeah. say that. <laughs> <laughs> you're a bad person, Whitman. <laughs> you can't charge. ruin that for me. You cannot <laughs> ruin charge for me. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Um, I'm skipping forward. Oh, he uses this phrase in chapter five, in other wordsing. In other words, this is your argument, and it's not actually your argument. It's just a straw man I'm going to say that I can easily just, you know, torch right in front of you, right? In other words, you're saying, you know, genocide is good? You know, that's that's the kind of tactic, yep. obviously, an extreme. Why are you a proponent of cancer for the poor? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Like that. And I feel like it wasn't that long ago, and we had the courage to completely call that out. And people from any side would say, that, that's gross and unhealthy and not profitable. Stop it. Of course, so-and-so doesn't think that. But now it's like, uh, that scored a point with the simple-minded people in the squishy middle we're trying to manipulate. Fine, say it. Say anything. And so I like that Jacob's just called it out by name. Okay, let's get to the thing that you want to talk about, the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. Do you, you ever do it? Oh, of course. First of all, explain it. Uh, let me explain it using the current phone time waster that I'm using, which is Bloons Tower Defense 6. It's a game where you deploy different types of monkeys along a track, and then they use darts to pop attacking balloons. It's important. It's very important. And in this game, 
you get to a certain part, I mean, you got an hour invested in this thing spread out over a couple days of playing, and you get to this really difficult wave of balloons that attack you, and you weren't quite set up properly with your defenses, and you lose. And then the game gives you this option, restart or pay a few dollars of your video game money that's very hard to earn to keep going from that stage with a few extra bucks and fuse to change around your defenses. And it is so effective on me. I'm like, ah, oh, I've been working on this for 45 minutes. And yeah, I'll just you do... physical. Uh, you pay actual dollars? No, it's fake video game money. I'm not paying oh, okay. actual dollars to, to have monkeys shoot balloons. Settle down. Like, I'll pay for a game Dude, up Dude, you were, you were close to an intervention game. right then. <laughs> I understand. I understand. And so... But it's very effective in causing me to burn through my imaginary monkey money cash because it's like, oh, if I just make one tweak, then I'll get this. And then I do it, and then I lose again. And now it costs a little more for me to do it. And I'm like, ah, now I'm 400 bucks worth of fake monkey cash in the hole. I'll do 600 more. <laughs> and then pretty soon I burn through all my stash of monkey want- money, and I'm broke in the monkey game. I just want that to be my ringtone. Ah, oh, crap, I'm burning all my monkey cash. <laughs> <laughs> Surely this can be arranged. We have the technology. It's, well, my point is you're, you're, you're explaining a deep truth about my brain mm-hmm. effectively with monkey cash. Yeah, yeah, I am, and it's working. Do you sunk cost fallacy? Oh, of course I do. I sunk cost fallacy all the time. Like with time that I'm spending on things like, man, I've got so much time into this. It really has to be this way or that way or yeah, all the time. It's just really hard to think of examples. (laughs) The sunk cost thing that freaks me out is I'm afraid that if I fell for sunk cost once I could fall for it again. What if, what if all the stuff that I'm throwing my energy at morals, values and approach to life things that I'm trying to build, things that I'm trying to invest in others. I, I wonder what percentage of that I do because this is already what I do. I think I do it because it's what I think. But it's really hard to choose to be honest about whether the sunk cost fallacy factors into how I live and what I do. Hmm. I think when the sunk cost fallacy is really happening, you don't know. Like, you have no idea. That freaks obviously, me out. Obviously, you don't. Yeah, it freaks. I mean, think about all the bad things that happen in governments, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody's like, you know what? I'm going to be an evil dictator today. <laughs> and all, think about all those people that are fighting in those armies for those evil dictators. Mm-hmm. They, don't, they don't start like that. They're like, well, you know what? I mean, I've been a soldier since I was 20. I should probably still be a soldier now that I'm 50 or whatever. I see it in counseling. It's easy to see in other people. It's hard to see in myself. I see stuff where people started doing something and they weren't thinking real hard about it. It just kind of happened to them. And now it's breaking, but they will not walk away from that thing that is breaking because they just have so much time in it. They have so much identity in it. They broke relationships over it with other people they cared about. To acknowledge, oh, nuts, I'm only doing this over sunk cost, would be to acknowledge that they were wrong in everything they've thrown their energy at. Uh, that's, that's tough. I don't judge them. I'm sympathetic to them. But also, some things are true and real. And just because it's hard to go through life pursuing something doesn't mean it's sunk cost either. Thinking is hard. This book was hard. <laughs> yeah, we both <laughs> went right there. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's hard. Yeah. Um, last thing, rounding out the thought, he had a checklist at the, at the end of the book there. Yeah, let me pull that. I wrote, I wrote it down. Okay. Give it five minutes. Okay. Uh, focus on learning over debating was number two. Number three, avoid people that fan the flames. That's a good one. That's a really number good Number three, one. you don't have to respond or virtue signal. You don't have to. Yeah, And if you are in a position where you have to respond, then you need to reevaluate the people that you feel like you need to respond to because you're not really in a community. You're in some kind of weird thing. Yeah, you're trying to please um, an inner ring. Yeah, you're earning membership. Yeah, exactly. Or re-earning membership that in would, a flawed inner ring. Yeah. 
that was number five. It's not a community if you have to if you have to virtue signal. Number six, gravitate towards genuine community. Number seven, surround yourself with those who disagree with you and, and think about what they're saying. Assess your repugnant repugnantness. How do you say that word? I don't know. Repugnantness. That was what he said on number oh, eight, but he didn't explain that one. Repugnances? Okay. Yeah. What does he mean by that? Oh, the things that you hate, stop and think about them? Is that basically yeah, what Yeah, think about saying? what you're doing. I went and read the book that he referenced in this, Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind, and he spends a mm-hmm. bunch of time sharing like legit academic research on human repugnancy and what triggers it and why is it there. Really interesting stuff. I, I think you'd enjoy the book, but you need to kind of cleanse your system after this one for a little while before you read it. And so that's kind of one of the things that Haidt was wrestling with as well is why do these things trigger that repugnant reflex that they do? And when is that good? And when is that weird? Number nine, he says the ick factor is telling, or it could be a distraction. That was interesting to me. Um, Number 10, evaluate your myths. Like what analogies and metaphors do you use to explain the current situation? He says you need to evaluate those and make sure that they are actually holding up mm-hmm. and the value of the myth hasn't outvalued what you're actually trying to explain. Number 11, he says describe other ideas in other people's words without other wordsing. So if you have a position that I disagree with, I should be able to articulate it to your liking without you know putting words in your mouth that I'm setting up just to destroy. Which I think is so a that means beautiful truly, gesture of loving your enemy. Yeah, and it means listen is basically what it means. Mm-hmm. Like actually know how to listen and hear. Listen compassionately. And number 12, he says, be brave. Isn't that a great way to end the book? Be brave, yeah. Yeah. Speech right now is not steering us toward bravery, and it is not rewarding bravery. And what it calls brave is not brave. Yeah, you're right. I mean, people go on tours to apologize <laughs> for things that they say. They do. Yeah. They do. It's interesting. And you, as you and I were witness to at an event we attended, yeah, those people whose only power over you is that they are offended and you owe them an apology, you will never make them happy. There's nothing you can say. No amount of swords you can fall on. Well, those are the people that, that fan the that flames. that person happy. Yeah. They are. Yeah, and so you got to be careful. Don't give them your pearls. I think it was a good book, man. Good. It was good. a tough, meaty book. It, it was a, I mean, it was short. That was good. But it was, it was tough to get through all this stuff because you have to like hold the, the mirror up to your own face and figure out what you're doing wrong. That's not always easy. So I'm ready for something lighter. But that was good. Thank you for suggesting it. I, I'm also ready for something lighter. And I'm, I'm glad that we've recorded this now because all of our book reviews, we've avoided talking about this thing. And I've had so many things in interacting with this book where I want to pick up the phone and game it out with you or use this language and compare notes. And now we can. It's all on the table. So I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to how this book affects our conversations and the conversations that we have with other people together. Yeah. Man, this is so weird, dude. Last episode, we were talking about a possum loo- loose in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Named Corn Dog with 13 Named nipples. Named Corn Dog with 13 nipples. And now we're talking about all this deep stuff. Anyway, I should probably it's go good. to bed, dude. It's good rhythm. Yeah. Fair enough, man. Well, th- thanks for making the time. Thanks for, uh, thanks for engaging seriously with my book. That is, uh, that's a gesture of kindness and friendship that I appreciate. And I look forward to your next book. That was good. Yeah, I, I've uh, I got to figure that out. I will take suggestions from the crowd. Do you have suggestions on what book Destin should pick? Um, tweet them to us at No Dumb Cues. Yeah, and Matt, Indeed. you are not allowed to set up fake accounts. I'm going to go to the person that texted me and said Matt's not allowed to pick, and I'm going to say, what what book would you like me to? <laughs> would you, that'd that, be fun. That one person. That one. I am taking requests. Okay. Send them. Send them my way. Take it easy, buddy. Hey, take care, man. Thanks.